to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. Of the many questions that are asked in the Bible, there is one that rises to the top as the single most important. That's what we're thinking about today in our study of the book of Acts. What must I do? To be saved. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, stop what you're doing for just a moment, locate your Bible as we're going to look to the Word of God to answer this important question today. As always, our broadcast is brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the plan of salvation, worship, the church itself, whatever matter it may be spiritually, you will find people at the Lord's Church who would be happy to sit down and discuss God's Word with you, who would just simply open the Bible and, uh, and speak the truth in love, be happy to talk to you about God's Word. So we encourage you, if you're looking for a congregation to worship with, if you'd like to know more about the church, check out the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ meets on Sunday usually morning, Sunday night oftentimes, and Wednesday for Bible study as well. You can look them up in your area or from our website can help you find many congregations of the Lord's body in your area. Friend, we'd also like to help you in your desire to know God and to draw closer to Him here at the Gospel of Christ. We want to encourage you to check out our website. It's thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our video, audio, written material, transcripts, study guides, just a wide variety of good Bible study material available 24-7, free of charge. We'd love for you to stop by and check that out. And if you'd like to have a copy, of today's study or any of our lessons, today's study on the book of Acts or any of our lessons, we make that available to you free of charge as well. Just go to our website, fill out a free media request form. Uh, from there, you can let us know if you'd like to have it as a digital download. If you need a uh, CD for audio or a DVD for video, we send that to you free, free of charge as well. Just, just whatever you need, we'll try to help in that matter as well. And friend, we want you to check out our app available in both the Play Stores. Great way to study the Word of God. Keep up with what we're doing. Check out our new lessons. Keep in contact with us. And so download that for your smartphone. Great tool as well. Check us out on Facebook. Like us and follow us as well. Great way to keep up with what we're doing. Stay in tune with our studies together. As we mentioned, of all the questions that have ever been asked, we're thinking about that greatest question today in Acts chapters 13 through Acts chapter 16. Acts 13 begins by helping us realize that, that, that God sets people, God uses people, God uses each of us to accomplish His divine purposes in the world. In this context, in Acts 13 verse 2, the elders there separate Saul and Barnabas uh, to take the gospel, the good news, to the Gentiles. And in verse 2, it specifically says they were separated for that work. They, they lay their hands on them, they pray for them, and those men go out to be separated to do God's work. But, you know, as I think about Saul and Barnabas here, isn't it the case that each one of us has been separated from the world to do God's work? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. And so while Saul and Barnabas no doubt were separated from the world to a specific purpose, taking the gospel in that area to the Gentiles, friend, if you're a child of God, You've been called out of the world 
to do the work of God. You've been called to a labor of love. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, in which we have the privilege of proclaiming the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, in Acts chapter 13, Saul is going to preach Jesus. Paul is going to now preach Jesus to the people in Antioch who have maybe not heard about him yet. And look at what he says in Acts chapter 13. I want you to begin with me in verse number 38. He's in Antioch of Pisidia uh, preaching Jesus. He kind of goes through much like Peter did in Acts chapters 2 and 3, showing God's plan, showing uh, how the prophets told about it, how this is what God is working, bringing it all to a climax. And look at what he says in Acts 13 verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. What a great message we hear about in Acts chapter 13 as Paul preaches uh, Jesus to them. And, and listen to the clarity with which he preaches. This man, Jesus, he is able to justify you. The word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. He's able to justify you from everything, watch now, from which the law of Moses could not. Friend, the law of Moses was a good and holy and right law. According to Romans chapter 7, that law was never intended to be a permanent law. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 11 through 13 clearly teaches that idea. It was a specific law for a specific purpose, Galatians 3 verses 15 through 18, to point out sin and to prepare the way for the Messiah. But that law at its best could never take away sin. Hebrews 10 verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for, in, for sin forever, sat down to the right hand of God. Only Jesus, Hebrews 10 verse 12, could really take away sin. And so Paul preaches plainly that people have to put faith in Jesus and do what God says to be saved. And friend, that's the message you find throughout the Bible. The plain, clear message that only Jesus saves, nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so as we mentioned, just like in Acts chapter 2, Peter told them, repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Acts 3 verse 19, repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was told, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And so we hear about people believing, repenting, confessing Jesus as Lord, and just like in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 2, Acts 22 verse 16, they're told they must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, these people received that message gladly, and they actually asked Paul to come back the next week and preach the same message to them. What a, how, how Paul must have felt great to finally find somewhere where at least some of the people wanted to hear about Jesus. And so Paul now, in Acts 14, he goes into the areas of Iconium and Lystra as he is taking the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. He now takes the gospel to Iconium and Lystra. And these areas would be rather idolatrous. They'd be pagan areas, a lot of Greek people there, worshiping all kind of gods, much like in Athens, the unknown gods. And Paul preaches in Acts 14, 1 through 8, that they need to repent of their idolatry. He preaches about the Creator, how that He has not left Himself without witness, but He's done good, given us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness, and that God has left evidence of Himself. And so repentance from idolatry. There is a Creator of all things, and you can see that Creator by the evidence. And friend, that's such a, that message is so true still today. Listen to Hebrews 3 verse 4. The Bible says, Every house is built by someone. He who built all things is God. In the area that I live, there's a new house being built, and over the last about year, maybe eight months, there was nothing there at one point. Then some dozers and some dirt working machines came in, and they, they built up the dirt. 
Then some people came in and they laid a foundation. Then other people came in and they, they built walls. And, and now, after a period of time, there's a house people are living in that wasn't there six or eight months ago. I look at that house, I don't think, that just magic, wow, that house just magically appeared out of nowhere. It evolved over eight or 10 months. No, when I see that house, I automatically think, look at the good job those guys did building that house. Every house is built by someone. Uh, the, the building of something demands a builder. Look at the beautiful world we live in, complex, intricate, interdependent, amazing in its beauty and splendor, doesn't that shout out a builder? That's exactly what Paul preaches to these idolaters. These gods that you're worshiping, they can't build that. They're no gods, really. There is a designer. He's God. And it's the same one who, who causes the rain to fall, same one who causes the change of the seasons, same one who causes the fruit to produce on the fruit trees. He's the true God. His son is Jesus Christ, and he's provided a way of salvation for each one of us. Now, some of the people that heard that message loved it. Others hated it and, and ran Paul out of the city and, and actually took Paul out and stoned him. He got up from that later and lived, but it was a message they needed to hear regardless. We live in a world, friend, where there's a lot, of, a lot of ideas about God, a lot of ideas about how the world got here. A lot of those ideas don't even make good sense and are nothing more than man's hypothesis. But here's what you can know. A little, you can look around and you can see that things don't happen without someone to cause them to happen. This world that is so beautifully created, so intricate, so interdependent, how to get here? Well, there's a designer, and that designer is God. And that designer tells us about himself in the Bible, sent his son to die for us, and gave a plan of salvation, and that plan of salvation is found in Jesus Christ, and that's the message that we're trying to get across to people today. Now, as Paul leaves the area of Lystra and Iconium, in Acts 15, he's going to now have to deal with some false things that are being dealt with and taught in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem comes back up. There's a false doctrine that's being taught, and now that's going to have to be dealt with. Look at Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. And so some people came down of a Jewish background and said, that's not really all the story. You also got to keep the law of Moses. You got to be circumcised. You got to do all these things. Paul said, no, 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 that, that's out. We've already taught that, but there became a problem. And so they go to Jerusalem. Paul sent there. They meet with the apostles and the apostles inspired of God clearly show the old law was not for the Gentiles. That old law is no longer in effect for the Jews today either. You read Acts 15, about verses 3 through 35, and, and they, they, they clearly teach and show that the, the Gentiles don't need to keep the old law. They, they need to be morally correct and do things that are right before God, but it's not the old law and it's not Moses that's going to save them. It's Jesus. John 1, 17 says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.14, Ephesians 2.14 and 15, the law of commandments contained in ordinances has been taken out of the way. It's been nailed to the cross. It's no longer binding on us today. Hebrews 8.13 says, in that he says a new covenant. He's made the first, the old Ten Commandment covenant, he's made the first obsolete. What is growing obsolete, becoming old, is ready to vanish away. In the first century, the inspired Holy Spirit said the old covenant was obsolete. Now, what in the world does that mean? If I said, do you think about something today that is obsolete, what would you think of? I would think of the first computer I ever used. Can you imagine trying to use that computer today? I would think of an old telephone that you got to stick your finger in and wind it around for every number. Pick up a handle on it with a string on it. Man, nobody can imagine that. Today. Can you imagine trying to ride to, call, ride to church or ride to town in a horse and buggy? That horse and buggy, that old telephone, that first computer, it's obsolete. What's that mean? It's been replaced by something better. 
The old law, old covenant is obsolete. The new covenant is in effect today, and we're under the new law of Jesus Christ. And so Acts 15 deals with that whole idea. Now, in Acts chapter 16, we're going to see two cases of conversion. As we said, the book of Acts is all about what must I do to be saved? And here we find two accounts of that, Lydia and her household and the Philippian jailer. Let's begin in Acts chapter 16, and I want you to see the conversion of Lydia and her household. In Acts 16, look in verses 11 through 15. The Bible says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out to the city, when it went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to think, heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. And so here we have this account of, of Lydia, her household. We don't know all the people that were there, but what we do know is there's these women. We're specifically there were women on the Sabbath day gathered at the river where prayer was customarily made. And Paul goes there and he begins to teach them and talk to them. And he tells them about Jesus and the plan of salvation and, and uh, about God's new law in effect, no doubt, and how to be saved. And God opened Lydia's heart. Well, how did God open Lydia's heart? Entrance of what God's word gives light. Psalm 119, 130. When Paul preached the gospel and she was pricked in her heart, Acts 2, verse 37, the word of God broke through that hard shell and she responded the right way. And so God opened her heart through the preaching of the gospel and her and her whole household are baptized and they pretty much take Paul in while he's there and help him. What do we learn about God's plan of salvation here? Friend, this is what's so beautiful about the book of Acts. The synchrony, how it all so beautifully every time, time and time again, we have the same things occurring as it relates to the plan of salvation. God's message is preached, like in Acts 2, like in Acts 3, like in Acts chapter 8. You've got to hear the word of God before your heart can be opened. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. People must believe with all their heart that Jesus is the Christ. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Men and women are taught to repent and be baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 3, verse 19. And, and just like in every case, Lydia and her household were baptized. Friend, the Bible in its synchrony is so beautiful that it, it all flows together so well. God didn't tell one person to do something different and another, no, the message, we may find a different point emphasized, but when you put the totality of it together, God's plan of salvation, Acts 18, verse 8. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Friend, this is what we find in the Bible. Lydia and her house, household were baptized. Now, are we saying that infants were baptized? Sometimes people run this and they say, well, infants were there. Well, friend, you have to assume something the Bible, that's not provable. There's no evidence to show that. And beyond that, the things that we know you've got to do teach us there were not infants there. A person must believe. Infant doesn't have that cognitive ability there. A person must repent of sin. Infant doesn't understand that. A person must confess. Infant may not be able to talk. When we take the word her household, we have to define that by the terms the Bible sets for those who can be saved, and infants just don't meet that. And so it's not logical to say there's no evidence of it, number one. And it doesn't logically fit what the Bible teaches one must do to be saved. And so Paul now leaves the, in that region uh, where Lydia and her household are there. And he's going to go to Philippi. He's going to go further in, in, in Philippi here. And he's going to, as he's preaching, 
some things are going to happen where people oppose that message and Paul and Silas are actually put in prison for preaching the gospel. Now, you might think to yourself that that's a bad thing. Paul's just trying to do good. He's just trying to preach the gospel and he's put in prison for preaching the truth about Jesus. Well, God takes the bad and he uses it for good. And Paul and, and Silas didn't give up to begin with. They're in prison. They're praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners are listening to them. But something amazing happens in that prison in Philippi. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 16, and I want you to see what happens beginning in verse number 25. The Bible says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, everyone's chains were loosed, and the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he brought them in the house, he set food before them. He rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. What an amazing scene this is. Here they are praying, singing, prisoners listening to do them, and God intervenes. Great earthquake, so much so that the, the, the foundation is shaken. The walls of the, the doors of the prison come open. You imagine what must have happened when those doors come open. And this Philippian jailer who was responsible for Paul and Silas, thinking that they've probably run out, he wasn't supposed to sleep anyway, and thinking that they've probably run off and knowing that he's responsible with his life for theirs, He's about to kill himself. No good living. I'm going to die anyway. But he hears this. Sir, we're all here. Do yourself no harm. And he double checks that, runs with him to the light, sees it's the case, falls down before them. Greatest question to ever ask now comes. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, you believe on, you believe on Lord Jesus, you and your household, and you will be saved. Now, he's not even heard about Jesus yet. So Paul begins to preach to him about Jesus. Uh, he, he gets it that Jesus is the Savior. He now, showing repentance, washes their stripes. He knew what happened was wrong. He was sorrowful for that, so he believed in Jesus. He's willing to repent, wash their stripes, and show remorse for that. And he and all his household are baptized. And the Bible sums it up in verse number 34 by saying, that he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. When he heard the message, when he had that idea of remorse, when he was baptized, friend, the Bible then says, that man did what believing on the Lord Jesus is all about. And so the great question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friend, the Bible gives us the answer in the book of Acts. We ask you today, have you done what the Bible says to be saved? Do you have a heart that you want to please God more than anything else? Are you like Saul of Tarsus, Philippian jailer? Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, here's what we learn as we look through the accounts of conversion in the book of Acts. You absolutely must believe in Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will, future tense, be saved. Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God? Matthew 1, 19 through 21, John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to have that remorse and be sorrowful for sin? Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3, verse 19. Would you acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior with your mouth? The Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And friend, to have every sin washed away, to really believe on Jesus the way the Bible says, 
you've got to do what the Philippian jailer did. He and all his household, those who believed, were baptized. Are you willing to be baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ? Galatians 3.27 says this, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. You can't get into Christ without being baptized into him. Did you know that you only contact the death of Jesus when you're buried with him in baptism? Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Did you know that Saul of Tarsus wasn't forgiven of his sins until they were washed away at the point of baptism? Ananias told Saul, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And my friend, did you know that for the very first time the gospel is preached, people were told, you must repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 verse 38. And do you know, did you know that Jesus said you've got to be baptized to be saved? The Lord said so plainly, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verses 3 through 5. And so, if you haven't done these things, friend, we urge you to today. The question, what must I do to be saved? It's too important of a question to listen to the voices of men. Let's hear what God says on the matter and let's do what God wants us to do. And so if you've not done that, we'd love to talk to you more about it. We'd love to study with you. We'd be glad to help you in that matter. And friend, as always, our hope and our prayer is that hearts will be open to the word of God and that people's will can be aligned with God's will. We hope you'll join us next time for our study of the book of Acts as we think more about this exciting book. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.